Joe, welcome. Greetings. We usually start our program with a prayer from an elder in Indian country. Today is a little different. I received news very early this morning that Larry Kozard, who you just saw in the uh, video, uh, thank you, Kozad family, um, he died early this morning. If you are a singer, dancer, drummer, or happen to be at a powwow, you will recognize the Kozad family name. They are famous for their talented drumming, their voices, singing our songs for social, tribal, and intertribal gatherings. Larry was a Kiowa citizen from Oklahoma, a friend, close family member to many of us. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Kozad family, especially Kiowa Charlie, your stepsisters and stepbrother. Larry, 
I pray you fly with eagles on your journey back to the creator to join the big drum of those who have gone before us. Thank you. Welcome to another Bright Path Strong virtual event. I'm Nedra Darling, a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation and co-founder of the Bright Path Strong Foundation and executive producer of Bright Path, the upcoming Jim Thorpe feature film. I'm joining you virtually from my home on the original homelands of the Anacostians, also known more in recent times as the Piscataway and Pamunkey tribes of Maryland and Virginia. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe during the continuation of COVID-19 and the variants that have been discovered recently. Remember to double mask, distance, wash your hands frequently. If you're unable to have what to wash your hands, use hand sanitizers. Also, please remember to send good thoughts and prayers to those who have lost loved ones, to those suffering with the virus, and when you have the opportunity, thank our healthcare and service workers for all their hard work to get us through this pandemic. This has been an amazing week. I just have to give a shout out to Congresswoman Deb Holland, who had her confirmation hearing to become the secretary for the Department of the Interior. For those of you located in different parts of the world, Deb is a citizen of the Laguna Pueblo tribe, and she's also part Hamas. And when confirmed, she will be the first Native American woman to serve in the president's cabinet for the United States federal government. Deb is totally bright path strong. Good luck, Deb. We are so proud of you. I'm honored to be your host today and want to welcome our partners for the event, Running Strong for American Indian Youth and the Huntsman Senior Games. We are thrilled to have as our special guest today, who are two amazing people. If you didn't love them before this broadcast, you're going to love them by the end of this gathering. Biographer, historian, and author Bob Wheeler and gold medal Olympian Billy Mills. Please post your questions in the chat if you are in the Zoom room and we are monitoring other social media channels. You can ask questions there as well. As you can see, the talent, power, knowledge, and experience we have with us today could easily stretch over two days, so we better get started. Before we get into the program, though, we want to recognize one of our partners, the Huntsman Senior Games, and to welcome Kyle Case, who is joining us briefly. Kyle, thank you for being here to help start the program today. Well, Nedra, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, we cannot be more excited to be partnering with Bright Path Strong and Running Strong. For those athletes from the Huntsman World Senior Games who are joining us, I want to say welcome. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the games, very briefly, the Huntsman World Senior Games is actually the largest annual multi-sport event in the entire world for athletes over the age of 50. We host uh, every year about 11,000 athletes. They can choose from 35 different sports. And so there's a, a wide variety of options for people to stay active and to be engaged well into their senior years. Uh, age 50 is the youngest uh, athlete that we um, host at the games, but it goes all the way on up to over 100. And so it's just a great way to stay involved and engaged and, and participant. And uh, again, it, this partnership that we're developing now and the opportunity to work together is very exciting to us. Uh, I will put one quick plug in before I duck out and we're gonna get into the meat of the show today. And that is that our registration actually opens on March 1st. So if you're over the age of 50 and you're interested, I would invite you to visit seniorgames.net where you can get all the information schedules uh, registration fees, all that is there at seniorgames.net. And we'd like to invite you to be a part of the Huntsman World Senior Games. And once again, Nedra, thank you so much for this opportunity. Kyle, thank you and the Huntsman Senior Games for partnering with us today. We look forward to working with you again soon. And everyone, please go to their website and sign up for the Senior Games. And Kyle, I'm going to sign up for that really slow run walk, okay? So um, <laughs> look a, for my name got, there. I've got a place <laughs> for you, Andrea. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Great. I'll need a lot of help. <laughs> Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our other partner for today's event is Running Strong for American Indian Youth, 
an organization that Billy Mills co-founded and is a spokesman. He and his wife, Pat, have been very instrumental in the organization's growth and giving back to so many Native communities and Native people over the years. Running Strong strengthens Native communities by creating sustainable generational change and giving families the tools and hope to build a better life. Running Strong believes in the power of Native youth to strengthen our communities, overcome our economic challenges and poverty, and develop deep deeper cultural identities. Between Running Strong's critical needs program, water connections, winter clothing, utilities assistance, and their cultural programs designed to improve self-esteem and self-efficiency, they support a nationwide network dedicated to raising happy Native American youth. Running Strong has been helping with the COVID-19 relief, providing thousands of pounds of shelf-stable food, hand soap, sanitizers. Uh, They're completing the heat match program, helping families with the $100 matching program for heating bills on the Pine Ridge Reservation. They have a water project partnering with the Boulder City Rotary Club and the Medicine Root Garden Program on the Pine Ridge Reservation as well. And I don't want to say that I have a favorite program, Billy, but One of my favorite ones is, um, and they're all very, very important, is the Dream Starter Academy, where 10 amazing Native youth from across the country are given the tools they need to go make a difference in their communities. Each of them has a dream, and Running Strong recognizes that dream with a $10,000 grant and lots of mentor and emotional support. Running Strong Native youth are not only our next generation of leaders, They also have the dreams to carry out the visions of our elders. Please visit the Running Strong website to learn more about their fabulous programs and you can sign up for a run or walk with Billy and Pat throughout the year. Thank you Running Strong for being a part with us today. We we enjoy the partnership and look forward to many more things together. Have to talk a little bit about Bright Path Strong, of course. (laughs) The Bright Path Strong team, myself, Abraham Taylor, Chris Taylor, Josh Aker, Israel Curtis, Bob Wheeler, uh, Flo Ridlin, and Chris Nielsen, our board members, honorary board members, thank you all for your support and inspiration over the past seven months. Bright Path Strong, the Jim Thorpe Foundation was created because of an amazing man, a relative, friend, Native American hero, war hero, and acclaimed world's greatest athlete. He was the first NFL president, businessman, entrepreneur, American Indian leader, activist, and founder of the LA Indian Center during the Great Depression. And he was also an environmentalist. Of course, that was that is Jim Thorpe. Our movie Bright Path about Jim is currently in development due to COVID, though. We changed up our schedule and we will not be filming until it is absolutely safe to do so. So in the meantime, we at Bright Path have been busy. We founded the Bright Path Strong Movement to secure the restoration of Jim's original Olympic winnings. So if you haven't signed the petition, please go to petition.brightpath.com and also encourage your family, friends, and coworkers and everyone you know to sign the petition. We currently have over 70,000 signatures from people like you who request the International Olympic Committee to honor the world's greatest athlete by restoring Jim's original winning records, which declared him as the sole gold medalist in the pentathlon and decathlon events. The International Olympic Committee currently lists Jim as a co-winner. That is far from the truth. Jim's official winning records must be restored. Bright Path is a nonprofit set up to amplify and support Native voices and issues. Check out our our site at brightpathstrong.com and also learn about our new project led by co-founder Chris Taylor to bring clean drinking water to Indian country. And of course, my favorite part of the site is our store. I buy all of my gifts there and enjoy drinking out of my beverages out of these great mugs. So, um, get one. They're great. (laughs) And everything else we have there, enjoy. We do have some really good products. So to say all of that better about Bright Path Strong, please enjoy our short Bright Path video, The World's Greatest Athlete. 
When Jim Thorpe crossed the finish line of the 1500 meter race, the final event in the decathlon at the 1912 Olympic Games, he not only became the first American Indian to win a gold medal for the US, he brought home two gold medals more than a decade before American Indians were officially recognized as American citizens. The greatest athlete that ever lived. Not only in football, but as you know, he played baseball too, and that was his downfall. I, I'm not sure he really knew the ramifications of playing part-time summer baseball league when he was out of school. But that came back to haunt him because he did get paid a nominal amount, but it was money. He was playing for food and not playing professionally, but they felt it was appropriate to try to take his medals away and take away from his uh, accomplishments. That's why the uh, International Olympic Committee revoked his gold medals. Our young people need to hear about these heroes. We want people thinking and talking about not just Jim Thorpe and the medals he won and the, the records he set, but what he went through. If you look down, you see he's wearing two different pairs of shoes. That's resilience in practice. And that's overcoming amazing challenges in a way that's, you know, above and beyond anyone else in the world could have done at that time. He is the greatest. He is not just an American Indian hero. He is a national hero. Proclaimed world's greatest athlete by King Gustav V of Sweden, Jim Thorpe, born Wathohuk, translated as Bright Path, became an icon of Native American strength and resilience. However, six months after his historic win, revelations surfaced that Jim was paid what amounted to room and board while playing in a minor league baseball division in the summers of 1909 and 1910. The International Olympic Committee promptly stripped him of his medals, removed his name from the official record, and refused him the opportunity to defend himself. They awarded the gold medals to the respective silver medalists, despite the fact that both refused official recognition. In 1983, following a decades-long effort by supporters, and only after the Swedish Olympic rules for the 1912 Games were uncovered and legal action threatened did they relent, the IOC reinstated Jim Thorpe in the Olympic record and presented his family with duplicate medals. But the official Olympic record still erroneously lists Jim as a co-champion in his events. We are calling on the International Olympic Committee to finally right this wrong and restore Jim Thorpe's rightful wins. Join us. Add your name to the petition at brightpathstrong.com. When Jim Thorpe... Thank you. That We hope that you will go to the uh, website and sign the petition. Um, we're trying to speak loudly to the International Olympics Committee and uh, your signature will help us do that. Bob Wheeler, biographer, historian, proclaimed Thorpeologist. Well, I proclaim him that every day. You will understand why from his presentation. Bob is truly a gifted storyteller of Jim Thorpe's life. His book, Jim Thorpe, the world's greatest athlete is one of the reasons co-founder Abraham Taylor started on his journey to create the movie Bright Path. Bob, we are so proud you're on our team and keeping us within the facts of history. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Nedra. It's an honor to be here today. You and Billy are two of my greatest heroes. <laughs> the beginning of my odyssey, I call it an odyssey, was when I turned 10 years old and my birthday present from my father was this book, 100 Greatest Sports Heroes by Mac Davis. After I read it, I asked my dad why a Paul Bunyan type fictional person was in a sports history book. It said Jim Thorpe was the world-class athlete in 16 sports and a ballroom dancing champion. My father said he was a real person and the world's greatest athlete. These words of my father, along with two inspirations and one permission, was all I needed to get me to begin my quest to tell Jim's story. My first inspiration was finding a handwritten copy of Chief Blackhawk's autobiography in a rare book room. Blackhawk was Jim's ancestor and his words will resonate with me forever. The path to glory is rough and many gloomy hours obscure it. May the great spirit shed light on yours and that you may never experience the humility that the power of the American government has reduced me to is the wish of him 
who in his native forests was once as proud and bold as yourself. Tenth Moon, 1833. These words were prophetic for Jim's life as well. And here's what Jim said about Blackhawk. I'm no more proud of my career as an athlete than I am of the fact that I am a direct descendant of that noble warrior, Chief Blackhawk. My second inspiration was when I wrote to the top 10 sports historians. Incredibly, only one answered, Colonel Alexander M. Wayand, a West Point football All-American, but it was a pivotal response. Look at these words. He said, some ridiculous stories have been solemnly repeated by Pulitzer Prize winners, Grantland Rice and Arthur Daly. I repeat, watch carefully what you write because more lies have been written about Jim Thorpe than about any player in football history. What an incentive. But finally, the permission I needed to obtain from my parents to hitchhike coast to coast, back then lugging a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. But since many of Jim's contemporaries were approaching their 90s, it had to be started soon. I showed my mom and dad a hand-drawn map of the United States that Leo Lyons created for me with names and addresses of Jim's NFL teammates and competitors. Leo co-founded the NFL with Jim in 1920 and was the honorary historian of the NFL. What an incredible gentleman. With that template, I hitchhiked 12,000 miles and conducted 200 interviews with Jim's, all of Jim's children, his childhood, many of his childhood friends, classmates, and teachers. Incredibly, some were millionaires and some were homeless. I would talk to them on street corners in Detroit, for example. One thing in common with all of them, however, was as President Reagan said to me, Jim Thorpe was my greatest hero. Jim's widow, Patsy, let me use Jim's private papers. And I'm truly blessed to be the only writer to ever have access to them to this day. That's a story for another time. No one turned me down of all the people. No cell phones, no appointments. I left with $200 in my pocket and I returned with $200. Even President Eisenhower offered me $20 when I visited him in Gettysburg. He was worried about my hitchhiking. I didn't accept his kind offer. There's so much to tell you about Jim that I have selected just a few stories to mention here and chosen a few voices from the past to let you hear what others had said about him and what he had to say about himself. Born in 1888 with twin brother Charlie near Prague, Oklahoma, they were of Sac and Fox, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Irish, and French lineage. Charlie died at eight. Jim's mother died when he was only 11, and his father passed when he was 16. Jim talked over a thousand school assemblies. I have hundreds and hundreds of his speeches, but the one sentence I thought would resonate with you today is, he wrote, I never met a wild horse I could not catch, saddle, and ride. My life was lived in the open winter and summer. I was never in the house when I could be out of it. Boys and girls who would grow up strong must lay the foundation in a vigorous youth. I think that's very relevant today because a, a recent survey showed that uh, 85% of teenagers when given a, an afternoon off would, prather, would rather stay indoors than go outside. In 1911 and 12, as a student at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, Jim became a track and field star and football All-American. You all know that, I think, but he was also captain of the basketball team. And there's his picture there. I'd like to tell you the story of how Jim made the track team. Late one afternoon in the spring of 1907, Jim was walking across the Carlisle campus when he noticed members of the track team trying unsuccessfully to clear the high jump bar. Jim, in his words, wearing overalls and a hickory shirt, asked if he could try. They kind of snickered a little bit, but he gave it a try, and on his first attempt, he cleared the bar. 
The very next day, Coach Pop Warner sent a messenger to him and said, do you know what you have done? And Jim responded, nothing bad, I hope. Bad, you have just broken the school record at five feet, nine inches was the reply. Just for the record, later on, he jumped six feet, five inches. And then I thought the uh, how he got to be on the football team happened the following September. He begged Pop to let him try out, but Pop said, no way, you're my top track man. But he pestered him very determinedly for a couple of weeks. And finally, Pop gave in and handed Jim the ball and said to the team, have some tackling practice. Jim proceeded to run around and threw the entire team. After he did it a second time, he tossed Pop the ball and said, nobody is going to tackle Jim. My personal favorite play of Jim's in 1911 was against Pitt when he punted the ball 70 yards from the 10 yard line, sprinted down the field, outlet five Pitt players to catch his own punt and raced 20 more yards for the touchdown. In 1912, the next year, the national championship was on the line when Carlisle traveled to West Point. This game was such an epic, there's been books written about it. It was to be Army's roster of 30 players against Carlisle's 12-man team, who were also smaller in stature, but faster and more elusive. Despite the disparities, Carlisle prevailed against the cadets with seven future generals on their roster. I was fortunate to interview one of them, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Here's what he had to say. They like to write when you tackle them. That ended your career. They like to make a big oh, thing out of it. Oh, no, no. So you played after that. Oh, yeah, I played. I was hurt in the tough game. I wasn't, I wasn't hurting at all in, the, in this game. He can do everything that every, everybody else can do. Anybody else can do it, he can do it better. And we saw him, just without the slightest form, just put the football on his foot and kick it up 60 yards and punt. There's no trouble at all. We, we were standing back there, just like the, from 75 yards, you know, he, he just boomed the ball, wasn't spiraling or anything else, just boom down there. That's all it was to it. And he could throw the ball, he could run, he could tackle, he could do anything. Before talking about Jim's 1912 Olympic triumphs, let me mention a few interesting facts about his professional sports career. When Jim left Carlisle, he played professional football and baseball. Are you ready for this? For 16 years with overlapping seasons, no breaks. For relaxation, you're probably wondering what he did. He would go on hunting trips. In his last Major League Baseball season, he batted 327 with Boston. That was in 1919. And the next year, can you believe this? He was co-founder, as Nedra mentioned earlier, and unanimously elected first president of the NFL, as well as a coach and the biggest star of the league. He demanded that pro football be integrated. I love this, this element as well. Henry McDonald said, Jim's word was law. Another co-founder, George Hallis, some of you may know, the former coach and owner of the Chicago Bears, told me this about Jim's sportsmanship. I happened to catch a pass. When I was tackled from behind, and I was still trying to crawl a few more yards. And Jim Thorpe could throw his knees right into my head or shoulders or ribs. But instead of that, as I was on the ground, crawling around, you know, on, leg, on knees and arms, why he just, he just satisfied me and bore me to the ground. He said, well, if you're a horse, I'll ride you. And here's Jim himself. I love this one talking about the fans and the fun he had playing the game. It was a professional game played at Maslin High and, and uh, Rockney was on the uh, Maslin Tigers and I was on the Canton Bulldogs. 
and he played left end and I was playing left half back. Consequently, I had to go around his end, and he slipped through and tackled me for a couple of yard losses, and I said, at a boy, Rock, I said, you're doing fine, but I said, look at the people come up here to see old Jim run. How about letting old Jim run? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, if you think you can get away with that, he said, I'd like to see you. So the next time I carried the ball around, I hit him in the side of the head with my knee, spin it off for a 60-yard touchdown. And on the point after touchdown, why, here come Rock with a player under each arm, all wetted down with a sponge, and I walked up and patted him on the shoulder. I said, that a boy, Rock, if you let old Jim. Jim was so modest, they would get maybe 600 people watching oh, Jim. back then. And uh, after he played, it was up to eight and 10,000 each game. In the 1912 Olympics, he won gold medals in the pentathlon decathlon by training hard and mostly being his own coach. Burt Lancaster played Jim Thorpe in a 1950 movie about his life, so I wanted to interview him. Without an appointment, he agreed to meet with me and politely told his co-stars Ossie Davis, Telly Savalas, and Shelley Winters to take a break so he could talk with me about his hero, Jim Thorpe. This is Bert explaining how ridiculous some of the stories about Jim were. There was uh, one story told to me that Thorpe would often sit drinking a bottle of whiskey while he was practicing uh, what we call the long jump now, and then he'd just put it down and go out and jump like 24 feet 11, which was fabulous in those days. But you see, these are the kind of stories that, by the very nature of them, they sound phony. You know, as you say, if you know anything about training, you can imagine the kind of condition you must be in for a decathlon. I mean, it's, there's nothing to compare with it. I mean, even a mile runner who runs 125 miles a week in preparation and all. I don't think has to work harder that is if he's going to achieve great results than someone who does the decathlon and does it well. It's unquestionably the most grueling and demanding of all the track and field. I thought uh, was head and shoulders above the average athlete of his particular day. In, the, in uh, Jim's uh, mentor at Carlisle and lifelong friend Albert Exendine had this to say about Jim and his Olympic achievements. Now, uh, Jim Thorpe, of course, he was a good athlete, all-round athlete, everything. But you take the Olympic fellows of today, you know that. They practice Olympics years around, for several years. But uh, Jim Thorpe was out there playing baseball. He didn't try, have, try it all for Olympics, but Pop Warner got him up there, thought that right, so he should make it Olympics. So he gave him a trial in all those events up there. And he just picked it up and thought, thought I was really a track coach. But then, anyway, he uh, picked it up and uh, without any previous training, see, except in a year or two there, he went over there and I actually set the world on fire. You know, as an Olympic man, you know, he was sweet, went out there and greeted him. He says, you are the greatest athlete in the world. Thorpe says, thank you, King. <laughs> Finally, there's, there's so much to more, more to tell about Jim as a man and an athlete, but I will end this section with an account of something that happened minutes before the final event of the decathlon. This, this has become an epic story that, that I hear a lot of young people repeating today, and it's so inspirational. It was the 1500 meter race, and Jim reached into his gym bag to pull out his shoes, and they were missing. He asked a teammate in the locker room if he had an extra pair of shoes and was told there was one shoe in the wastebasket. It was too small, but he squeezed his foot into it. The other shoe he found after overturning a burn barrel outside. It was too big, but he put on a couple of socks to make it fit. He ran out and made it to the start line just in time to compete against the best decathletes in the world. He won the race in record time and the gold medal. I think this story sums up much of what there is to know about Jim and his resiliency and determination in the face of challenges. Thank you and Bright Path Strong. You are Bright Path Strong, Bob. That was fantastic, an amazing presentation. And Thank you for digging deep in your archives that you had personally um, 
with each of these uh, interviews. Uh, that's just uh, priceless material. That is great. It was so good to hear his voice. I, I'm distantly related to Jim, and I've heard about him all my life. And to hear that voice every time just goes right into me. Just it feels so great. So thank you for that. Um, you know, <laughs> your your work of a lifetime about Jim Thorpe, who was just such an incredible athlete. So uh, we're going to now move, speaking of another incredible athlete, to Billy Mills, the gold medal Olympian in the 10,000 meter run at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Billy's victory is considered one of the greatest Olympic upsets. And he will tell you more about that in a few minutes. Billy, thank you so much for being with us today. I've known you for many years and I'm so excited to be with you again. The pride and honor we native people hold for you in our hearts and soul runs very deep. We have this amazing connection with you. But in preparation for this event, I also found that true for your athlete colleagues, fellow Olympians, and your many, many fans. Billy, you are still and will always be our hero. Billy Mills, 1964 Olympian. Can you run it, please? Tokyo, 1964. Some of the athletes from various teams have broken ranks to get a closer look. U.S. girls. Yoshinori Sakai is now passing by the bands and through those traditional Japanese drums. Flags of all the nations. Now we're coming to one of the most impressive moments of the Olympics as Sakai will turn and salute the crowd before igniting the cauldron which will burn throughout the Olympic Games until the closing ceremonies and it will be extinguished. There it goes. The stretch produced an amazing finish by Billy Mills. The final lap for the gold medal in the 10,000 meter. And up front is Bill Mills. He's pressing Ron Clark, the world champion. Bill Mills in the United States, number 722, is leading Ron Clark. And in third place right now is Mahut Bakamuni of Tunis. A tremendous upset if Bill Mills can hang on. But Kamuni goes out ahead as Kamuni right now leading in the 10,000 meter. Ron Clark is third. Rather, Bill Mills is in third, Ron Clark is in second right now. This is the final lap for the 10,000 meter. The unheralded Mahut Gamuti of Tunis is putting on a tremendous sprint. He's out ahead of Ron Clark. Bill Mills, the United States, is in third place. And this will certainly be the fastest 10,000 meter ever run by an American. Here's Mills, who seems to be boxed in. Suddenly, there's an opening, and here he comes. Here they come down the final lap. Can Ron Clark catch the Moody? They're going through the field. He's coming up. He's passing the Moody. Look at Bill. Look at Bill. Look at Bill. Coming on. Bill is coming on. Oh. Yeah. It might be Bill Mills. What a tremendous surprise here. Bill Mills in the United States wins the 10,000 meters. Bill Mills in the United States. A tremendous upset. Wins the 10,000 meter here. His unheralded winner from Kansas. Let's go back and look with our other camera to see exactly how he broke through the pack. Here they come down the final lap. Can Ron Clark catch the Moody? They're going through the field. He's coming up. He's passing the Moody. Look at Bill. Look at Bill. Look at Bill. Coming on. Bill is coming on. Oh. Yeah. It might be Bill Mills. What a tremendous surprise here. Bill Mills in the United States wins the 10,000 meters. Billy Mills, the only American ever to win a gold medal in the Olympic 10,000 meter run. Yay, 
Yay, Billy. <laughs> I, I just have to say, Billy, in the chat, it's people are clapping and they're saying they can't watch it. I have tears in my eyes. They've got tears in their eyes. And, you know, watching this uh, when I was much younger, um, I, you know, I, the yells that I heard there, they were echoed where I was on our reservation at that time. So we are so thrilled you're here. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. That moment was very, very special to me. I, I felt it as if I had wings on my feet. And in fact, the last 100 meters, I know I had wings on my feet. My dad had told me when my mother passed away, he simply said, son, your wings are broken. You have broken wings. And it takes a dream to heal those broken wings. He died when I was 12. The Olympics became my dream. They became my catalyst to heal broken wings. On the victory stand, 1964, Tokyo, Japan, our national anthem has been played. It was, it was inspiring. It was powerful. It was beautiful. And yet, intermingled with the deep love I have for our country was an equal feeling that I did not belong. And coming back to the United States from Tokyo, new doors were opening for me. Those doors that opened would allow the half white side of me to enter but not the Lakota side of me. And I was confused. Why, why is only half of me being accepted? I wanted to know how many other people, how many other athletes felt that way? I wanted to know Jim Ford felt that way with all that he went through. I wanted to know if other athletes did. So I set on a journey my journey was going back to understand, study the past footprints of our history. And I also studied Native American athletes. So as I looked at that incredible presentation of Jim Thorpe's achievements, Jim Thorpe to me was a god. He was an Olympic god. And I want to share two other athletes with you. One that taught me to stay the course and one that became my Olympic hero, Jim Thorpe, an Olympic god. And then I want to share with you what I found in common with them and the footprints I had to learn about to see the future, the horizon of our future and how we as a country, for example, can heal. When I look back at all of the Native American athletes, two come immediately to mind, Frank Mount Pleasant. And I want to share with you a bit about Frank Mount Pleasant. And I don't know if we have a photo of Frank that's being put up now, but Frank Mount Pleasant was a member of the Iroquois Confederacy. He made the Olympic team in 1904, and he made the Olympic team in 1908 finishing sixth in 1908 in the triple jump and the long jump. He attended Carlisle, 1905 to 1909, made Walter Camp's second team All-American. He was a quarterback. It has been said about Frank Mount Pleasant, very poetically, to watch him perform is to admire him. To compete against him was to learn from him. And to know him was to love him. When I read that, tears came to me. I also read where he played the piano. And if you listen to him, casually play the piano, you would think you were listening to one of the great, great pianists, a concert pianist. 
He coached for a while at the end of his athletic career. Was a lieutenant in the Marine Corps, World War, or in the in the Army, World War One, 1937. He died. Two police officers found him on the streets, laid on a street in Buffalo, New York. His skull had been crushed. They took him to the hospital. Three days later, he died. The report that came out was from violence. He died from violence within 24 hours. That was changed to Frank Mount Pleasant fell and crushed his skull from the fall. I often thought of that. I often wondered what the truth and where the truth lies. But Frank Mount Pleasant taught me, regardless of how difficult our challenges are, he taught me to stay the course. But I said Jim Thorpe was my Olympic god. He's an Olympic god. He dwells on Mount Olympus with Zeus, the Greek god, and others. But my, my Olympic hero was Buster Charles, an Oneida Indian. Buster Charles in 1929 won the first six events at the US National Decathlon Championships. I was told he injured his back and his lands sprained an ankle. He could not have finished, could not finish the event. 1932, he's healed up. He wins the Olympic trials and he's participating in the decathlon at the 1932 Olympic Games with Jim Thorpe sitting up in the stadium. Buster Charles led for the first day and the old injuries came back. He finished fourth. He was my hero. Years later, after my Olympic victory, I'm at a conference, the Marquis had engineers conference, and it made, had the names of five Olympians who were attending another function at that hotel. I was one of the five. As I walk in, a man comes out of the lounge and said, which one of you Olympians is Billy Mills? I raised my hand and he said, we have one of our colleagues in the lounge having dinner. He's been waiting for you. He wants to meet you. And I just simply said, since it was an engineering conference, is it Buster Charles? They said, yes, you, you know Buster. I said, no, but, but I don't know what to say to him. They took me in, six foot three, broad shoulders. He stood up, I'm looking up to him. I can't speak. Buster put his arm around me and said, just relax. Uh, I finished fourth, you won the gold medal. I said, Buster, you're my hero. We, we became friends. Now Buster's approaching 98 years of age. I'm in North Dakota, South Dakota, receiving a trophy from a school that gives out the Buster Charles trophy. At Haskell, I won the Buster Charles award, but they had no trophy to give me. I'm thrilled I'm receiving my Buster Charles trophy. I come home. I call Buster, tell him I finally received my Buster Charles award. His daughter was on the phone and she said, Billy, my father died. And as I was saddened, he told me the story. He had a, he had a stroke, 98 years of age, but he was recovering, strong, he's recovering. His wife died. When Buster was strong enough to hear the words that he lost his wife, they told Buster she's on her spiritual journey. Buster simply said, when did she die? They told him. He said, there's still time. There's still time for me to catch her. So like an Olympian, swifter, further, faster, Buster, it's eating. Starts himself. He passed away to join his wife. Together they went 
on their spiritual journey. Pastor Charles has been my hero from the time I was a child. I learned from Buster. I learned from Frank Mont Pleasant. I learned from my Olympic God, Jim Thorpe, Bright Path. On my journey, I found that I was related to them in many, many ways, just by life and by the footprints laid on Mother Earth. But I want to share with you, we are all related from this manner. I went back to 1493, trying to understand why, why only half of me is accepted. And I studied the doctrine of discovery. I'm a Christian man who's taken Lakota virtues and values to follow as a Christian man. So what I'm gonna say is not an attack on Christianity. It is not an attack on Jesus Christ, but it shows you how we need to understand the words we choose to speak. We need to understand the power of perceptions. They can create us or destroy us. 1493, courtesy of the Vatican, the Pope, wrote the Doctrine of Discovery. America today needs to understand it. The Doctrine of Discovery simply said, any new lands found in reference to the new world can only belong to the first Christian monarch that discovers them and the inhabitants of those lands, the indigenous people, based on archeological digs, estimates of, of 60 to 100 million indigenous people on land and on the shores of the new world only people that can own land would be the first Christian monarch that discovers them. Those inhabitants must come under international rule of law. Their laws, their religion, their songs, their dance, the sacredness of the drum no longer applies, and they must submit to Christianity. But then it was quickly realized if we became Christians, we could own land. So that's the dark part of our history, where they said we had no souls, we're not human. They justified legal theft of our lands. 1823, the United States Supreme Court, to win a lawsuit, based their defense on the simple fact, Indian people cannot own land. Treaty signed, treaties broken. That gave birth to manifest destiny. This land is a gift to European immigrants from God. It was a, land, it was a gift to half of me. The other half could not own land. Manifest Destiny gave the right to our government to sign treaties and break treaties, locking us outside of the American dream. To participate in the American dream, you have to have ownership of property. Now the land had to be developed. Slavery. No, no words can express the, the inhumane treatment of, of innocent. When the slaves were freed, Four million new citizens. Our leadership, of our national government, goes out to the poor white. Maybe some of them were my relatives. I've never met a white relative. And when I do, I will feel complete. And simply said to the poor white, don't let them take your jobs. They developed great skills as slaves. Don't let them take your jobs. Jim Crow's born. One year before the Olympic Games, 1963, the Civil Rights Act was passed. We all know how leadership responded to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. We've all seen the footage of elderly men, women, some children being hosed across the street with the power of the fire hose. I went to Dr. Martin Luther King's church. I wanted to understand, perhaps get a feeling like I did of the great Olympic athletes if they felt the same way I felt not belonging. I went to the church where those four young girls were putting on their robes to sing in the choir and maybe celebrate their newfound freedom when the bomb went off. That was counteracted, the Civil Rights Act, with the war on drugs. And the war on drugs is just beginning to come out in the study of it to make hippies and young black men felons. Hippies were soon replaced with young men of color. War on drugs spread to the reservations. Many of our reservations today 
seventh, eighth, and ninth grade girls have to find a different place to sleep every night because if you're on meth, your first quest is the advantage of the innocent. The footprints, what I found, the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, treaty signed, treaty broken, slavery, Jim Crow, the war on drugs are etched into every fiber of our social way of life, our educational system, our political system, our entrepreneurial system, forever dictating our rule of law. And two things were created. Generational trauma. I have generational trauma in line with Jim Thorpe. Frank Mount Pleasant. Maybe generational trauma contributed to his death, I don't know. Buster Charles. But it also created generational privilege. Half of me, they had doors halfway open to profit from generational privilege. I've tried to reject and stand by the grandmas that I saw who had no voice. Generational trauma, generational privilege today in America are being challenged to come together. Generational privilege created systemic racism. We all have in common either generational trauma or generational privilege from systemic racism. That's the challenges people like Jim Thorpe faced, Frank Mount Pleasant, Buster Charles. That's the challenge our young people, future generations will, will face. Sport taught me to come together. Sport taught me global unity through the dignity, character, beauty of global diversity, the future of humankind if we choose. But that's also the future of America. So in closing, I want to dedicate a 90 second video about dreams, the Bright Path Foundation, to Running Strong Foundation, to all of those that make our dreams come true. When the video is over with, it's 90 seconds. I'll close in one or two minutes. Let's have the video. I dedicate this to you. Oh, thank you. It's special. Amazing. the sound that saved a wretch like me. How precious did that grace appear. The Jesse Owens, in closing, simply said everybody should have a dream. Running Strong for American Indian Youth has dreams. Today, we support Red Path Foundation's dream of asking you to sign the petition that simply calls on the International Olympic Committee to restore Jim Thorpe as the sole winner of the gold medal in the 1912 Olympic Games in the decathlon. Simply join us by going to www.petitionbrightpathstrong.com. I'm humbled, I'm honored to have been with you. God bless.
Thank you, Billy. Um, your race made me cry. The closing video made me cry. Seeing you is making me cry. <laughs> Thank you so much. So touching. What a beautiful video that was. And I'm so proud that you were in it and that people recognize your strength and all that you've done before, during, and after your Olympic career. I mean, you're just just such a such a role model for so many people. You know, we always think in the native world that you're ours and we're just, after, you know, we're, we're looking at you, but the world looks at you and watches you and they, they grow with you, they pain with you. So um, I'm just so, my heart is so touched. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for those of you uh, out there, we're running short on time, but I do want to uh, really accept the embrace that Billy made to our organization and when we were struggling of the name of how to get our organization named and uprighted, he was so, Billy was so gracious and very encouraging and, and just supporting us, he and Pat both. And, and I would write them a note and they would write back. And it just, it just was so great to have them beside our, our side all the way and to know they're going to be with us throughout is, is tremendous. And, you know, we struggled with our name. And so finally I called Billy one day and I said, you know, we kind of landed on something and I need your permission on this. And it was Bright Path Strong. And he said, absolutely. So we feel strong and, and we're all strong together. And uh, we want everybody to know that. And thank you, thank you, thank you, McGwitch. I, I don't know what to do. We're running out of time. If those of you out there have to go, we understand. And I cannot believe the fabulous stuff coming in from all of you that are, are typing little notes in the chat. Thank you. Uh, oh, I could go on the list. I started writing things down. It gets too numerous. But one that I feel like I have to talk about is, Billy, your cousin in California says hello and that you're doing a great job. <laughs> I guess you'll know who that is. <laughs> and um, uh, Manuel and Karen, thank you for your wishes. I'm assuming you're the Karen and Manuel that I know in Virginia uh, for all Bob, Billy and I and everything. And um, oh, just there's just so many coming in. It's just terrific. April H, I think I know who that is. And thank you for your wonderful words. And we do have a couple of questions. No, we have several questions in our queue. So um, again, put your questions our way. And Billy and Bob, if you have a few more minutes, can you stay on to answer some questions? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. And I do want you to know also, Billy, there's a special uh, chat in the chat, and I hope the young man doesn't mind me calling out, but um, I think that... Uh, we need to acknowledge that he wanted you to know that he was somebody watching the race at Chamawa Indian School during his senior year, and you made such an impression on him. So thank you. And Bob, many thanks for your research have come in as well. So this is fabulous. We're going to start with, uh, oh, I recognize this young woman, uh, Naomi Taylor. She's nine years old from Park City, Utah. She asked, Billy, what do you think about schools and professional teams changing their mascots? Is this a movement you support? Thanks. You support the mascot changes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I definitely support the mascot change. Uh, we're, we're, we're not mascots. <laughs> exactly. <We're, laughs> Great. And Naomi? Traditions, our spirituality is sacred. Yeah. Naomi, thank you for that question. And uh, I hope that... Uh, if there are any of those mascots in your area, you will join us in, in saying no more mascots, please. Uh, we have another one, uh, greetings from Guela Nation. And their question is, have other Olympic athletes of color expressed this level of injustice that Jim Thorpe did? And if so, could those athletes be used to establish a precedence of the committee to deny athletes their winnings based on color? Now, the, the only... <clears throat> The only, <clears throat> excuse me, the only way I would try to relate that is there have been athletes now that have been for two or three years, they've had to not, they were not allowed to compete because they were performance enhancement athletes that were caught taking a particular drug. They had to sit out for so many months or 
a couple of years, then they can come back and compete. But nobody has had the circumstance of Jim Thorpe. If I understand right, the International Olympic Committee left it up to the United States Olympic Committee on whether or not Jim Thorpe should have his gold medal taken away. The U.S. Olympic Committee made the decision. And I just see we have to we have to put that in that perspective of generational trauma, generational privilege and systemic racism. And that has to be changed. Uh, I, I, I won my gold medal. I, excuse me. I, won, I set my world record by five hundredths of a second. And by mistake, it was the new photo, photo finish, the new automatic timer, but they could not find the new rule book. So they used the old rule book, a race six miles and above, to make an adjustment for error. They moved my time down five twentieths of a second, uh, five hundredths of a second, to equal the second fastest time, and we became co-holders of the world record. But but I I had no I had no problem with that because uh, there's nobody I could think of better to share to share a world record with than the runner I had to share it with, little Jerry Lindgren. Great. Um, Bob, do you have anything you want to add on that? or? I, I would like to, uh, I'm in daily contact with Jim Thorpe's grandchildren, and I just want you to know, Billy, that they all love you and have so much respect for you. They've heard the story countless times in 1997 when you were present in Hayward, Wisconsin at Coeur d'Alene and the AAU restored the AAU gold medals to Jim's name along with his records and they had seven sets of those medals recast and give, given to all seven surviving Jim Thorpe children. They've all passed, but their children are so grateful for what you did and i just i'm so glad i get a chance to say this to you so that other people can hear how me how much you mean to the jim thorpe family to this very day that's wonderful that's that's true and uh, we do have some of the members on our uh, honorary board as well so um, uh, we appreciate their guidance and and uh, working with us throughout the project as well on our foundation um, I just wanted to check back in with you, Billy. Uh, Don Brown Eyes is the cousin that left you a message earlier. So just wanted you to know that. <laughs> She's letting me know who it was. So um, we have some, and, and people out there, if you want to put where you're from, that's very good too. I forgot to ask for you to do that earlier, but we have one from Darren Goldner. Uh, when we talk about Jim Thorpe, why aren't we talking about the specific tangible conditions he faced? Example, the Carlisle School was racist, colonial institution, the Olympic amateur, amateur rules were meant to exclude those who weren't wealthy, uh, football was segregated, Thorpe-based racism, exploitation throughout his career. We suffer if we uh, mythologically, you know, give him a mythical view of himself without talking about the injustice. And thank you, Billy, he says, for speaking directly about the forces of colonization, classism, and racism. It's a great question. Uh, who wants to start first? I know both of you have a lot to, to talk about in this area. Um, I'd, I'd like to let Billy sum it up, but, but just to preface it, I deal with, with reporters on a daily basis. The average national reporter gets 300 emails a day and their press releases, not just notes, not just letters, they are press releases. And these writers can only do two columns a week. So I think that, that what I would answer that question, Nedra, is given people's lack of time, given the COVID that we're enduring now, please go to brightpathstrong.com. It is so clearly laid out. These are history facts. I got a letter yesterday from a top historian said, I hope a new Olympic history book of the 1912 Olympics and Jim Thorpe will be written because so much information has come out that, that 
proves the racism that Billy is talking about with documents from the Carlisle Indian School, the Cumberland County Historical Society and the Dickinson College. They have unearthed tens of thousands of pieces of paper from ex exposing the horrific racism that, that uh, Jim Thorpe endured. I think Billy probably knows this, undoubtedly knows it, but Jim Thorpe's roommate, the quarterback of the team, Gus Welch, started a petition, a student petition at Carlisle, unheard of, after the uh, gold medals were re revoked from Jim Thorpe, saying that we've got to expose the, the racism, the uh, stealing of money, the horrific treatment that we're enduring. And Gus Welch went to Congress. They came in to Carlisle unannounced, and that began the end of the Carlisle Indian School. It shut its doors forever in, in 1918, and it was started by a student petition who witnessed Pop Warner barging into Jim's room with a confession uh, for, for his uh, playing summer baseball that Pop Warner and Moses Friedman, the superintendent, had written and forced Jim to sign it as if it were his own confession. It so outraged Gus Welch that he started a student petition and it ended up with the closure of the Carlisle Indian School forever. And I'd like to interject before we uh, go to Billy, and that is, I think that what, Darren, what you're writing about in your, your question is, um, the reason that I'm on this project, you know, I, I recently retired from the federal government and could have been doing a lot of things, but um, was I met up with um, Abraham Taylor, Chris Taylor, and back then Rick Hill, many of you know, and um, came on the project as an executive producer because one thing that I'm dedicated to after being in the federal government and living the life that I've lived, uh, we're going to get to the truth. And that is what we're doing in our movie, Bright Path. Uh, we're not holding back. Uh, that's why we're going to facts. We're going to historical facts. That's why we rely on Bob. Bob doesn't pull any punches to glamorize or mythicize, anything like that. We're telling the truth. And both my parents went to Haskell, you know, back in the, let's see, I think it was the, the, the teens, basically. They both left. Uh, my father, Prairie Band Potawatomi, left the reservation. They came and got him at seven. My mother, Cherokee from Oklahoma, she also left home at seven and they were taken to Haskell. And um, the trauma is there, it's real. And we're, we're ridding of it, we're shedding it. But I'll tell you, one of the greatest things, I wake up every day because I know that I'm gonna help create a fantastic movie and it's going to be the Indians are going to win. <laughs> and we're going to root for the Indians and the Indian wins and then the Indians win. <laughs> so I wish I could tell you more. Uh, stay tuned to uh, even our brightpathmovie.com uh, website. But, um, you know, I'm praying every day that we get through COVID and we get to start on the movie, uh, but we're not going to do it till it's safe. We have a lot of people that were going to look forward to being participants in the movie. We want to reenact several things with a lot of Native actors and actresses. And we certainly want to bring on any technical people and, and we're, we're going to be ripping hard. So keep in touch if you're interested in that, but we are not going to do anything but let the truth be told. You know, Jim was a guy that if you read more and more about Bob's book, it's he, he didn't he didn't he didn't dwell and I remember the the things that my parents uh, would talk about with Jim they were very close and and he didn't dwell on the 1912 Olympics later on you know he he moved on he he like uh, was presented earlier he played back to back baseball back to back just went one right into the other season um, you know he he didn't idle he didn't idle at all uh, he became an entrepreneur. He, he, you know, in the Depression, my gosh, we had so many people from Oklahoma, everywhere, moving out to uh, California. And there he was encouraging people to come out, you know, be a part of MGM where he worked. And he was an entrepreneur. He, in his spare time that he wasn't working, he actually create, helped create the L.A. Indian Center that is a 
strong center today. And um, I love the story that I learned from Jim and, and that is, I mean, from Bob about Jim. And that is when, uh, when they said that the LA center was running low on food and more people were coming in. Um, that was not a problem for Jim Thorpe. He got his shotgun, got in the car and he went up to the Hollywood Hills and he got dinner. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's just so many, so many stories. And like I said, we, we need another few days and, and maybe we can do that. But, um, and, and again, you know, don't stop. I mean, the things that Billy mentioned is um, amazing that, uh, you know, the doctrine of discovery, um, you know, speaking about colonization and classism and racism um, today is today's the day, you know, say it out loud, you know, say it out loud. We have a Congresswoman going for a huge cabinet level seat in the government and she just wants to protect our lands. She wants to protect our people. She's looking out for the welfare of everybody's future. So we have to be strong supporters of those people, our own people and other people, as Billy mentioned, and work together and become our family that we can move strongly ahead. Billy, did you have anything else to say about that or? Well, I, you know, with my, with my deafness, Pat was giving me, <laughs> Pat was giving me, because I read lips, was giving me a, a note in regards to one of the questions. So I'll just try to generalize it in regards sure. to, in regards to families being separated at, at, in racism at Carlisle. The, the way I'll try to say that is that there were two things that were coming together. We signed treaties. I read my treaty, the Lakota Treaty with the United States government. In lieu of the vast domains of lands and natural resources, we are given up. You, the U.S. government, must forever provide a schoolhouse and a teacher for every 30 years for our children who want to learn your way. Not a free education, paid for in advance by the vast domains of lands and natural resources. So we knew the buffalo was gone. We had to find a new economic source. But at the Indian schools, there was the systemic racism concept of just wanting to take the Indianness out of the Indian rather than accepting their spirituality and our culture, our traditions, our spirituality. And that's where our virtues and values come from. Instead of letting us extract the virtues and the values of our culture, traditions, and spirituality and put those virtues and values into our educational pursuits, they tried to totally take, quote, the Indianness out of us. Pine Ridge, my reservation was the first to go to Carlisle. One promise was made, let our young boys grow into young men, let their hair remain. As the buggies, the wagons were leaving the campus, you could hear the little boys crying as their hair was being cut. So that con conflict continued and it still exists today without dwelling on explicit forms of racism. But my personal experience Going to Haskell, I met Coach Tony Coffin, Potawatomi Indian. He was like a second father to me. <laughs> he taught me to take the culture, the traditions, the spirituality, like my father was trying to teach me, extract the virtues and the values, and put those virtues and values into my pursuit of my dreams for direction, for confidence, for clarity of mind. So my experiences at the boarding school were very sacred. I had teachers that tried to empower me as a young man of Indian ancestry, not take the Indianness out of me. So I, I was very, very blessed, but I'm well aware of the generational privilege that created systemic racism and how that filled the hallways of our boarding schools. And a follow-up to that, uh, there's a question, Billy, for you that is asking, could you briefly share who took care of you after your mom died and then who took care of you after your dad died? And I think you kind of answered it, but if you could direct it more toward that time period, they would probably appreciate that. I, I, I was blessed because I had an older brother, Sid. He was kind of the overseer, but who was worker bee <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. really took care of me. 
and it was my older sisters. Uh, our women are sacred. Uh, my sister Margie was always there for me. My sister Moni, Ramona, was there for me. My sister Thelma was more my age, and my daughter sister Margie and Ramona was there for my sister Thelma. My older brother Sid, though, became our father. He became our mentor. So I had the older brothers, my brother Walt, and then I had other extended family that was there. But generalizing it, who took care of me was my older and younger brothers and sisters. I knew I was cared for. I knew I was loved. And simply by how they would look at me, I knew they did not approve of what I was doing. And to try to meet their approval, I tried to do things better. But I was blessed to be taught to take the culture, traditions, and spirituality, extract out the virtues and the values, and put those virtues and values in my daily living. So half Lakota, half white, I was blessed in many ways to be trying to live the spirituality of the Lakota way. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. We love those older siblings that when um, parents are busy and so much is going on, they step in and make sure we're doing the right things. I'm speaking as the youngest child, of course, by many years, but anyway, that's great. Uh, bless Sid's heart, actually. <laughs> so, um, there's another question, Billy, and I'm, I'm uh, sitting here thinking, why didn't I ask you this myself? Um, um, is there a new movie about your life story? Uh, what do you want to include that wasn't included in Running Brave? Um, and tell us how that movie changed your life. Tell how Running Brave changed your life, and if you had another movie, how you would change, how you would make it different. Okay, I, Running Brave did not necessarily change my life. But let me tell you what the purpose was and what it did. And I feel blessed that I could contribute in the way I'll explain. Running Strong was my giveaway. The, the, the movie, the movie Running Brave was my giveaway. I wanted to take and empower the wisdom of the elders and inspire the dreams of the youth. And I wanted to, in some way, take the virtues and the values and empower people in need, people that were lost in many ways like me. That became my Running Strong for American Indian Youth program, co-founded with Gene Kresak and myself. Running Strong has been extremely effective in parts of Indian country. The movie helped solidify Running Strong in many ways. But more importantly, in my, in my heart, the movie influenced a number of countries worldwide. It was in 32 countries. My wife and I were in Cape Town, Africa, and there's this pedicure, manicure, massage, health spa. She's gonna go get an hour and a half massage. So I go with her, this young lady comes and says, Patricia Mills, I'm your therapist. I thought she was Danae. I thought, what is this Navajo lady doing here in Cape Town? I said, I'll find out. She's working on Pat and Pat said, where are you from? She said, I'm, I'm Tibetan, born in Northern India. Uh, what are you doing in Cape Town? My father was marrying me off to an older man I've never met. My brother said I should be able to pursue my dreams as a young woman and empower other people in our community. My father said no. So my brother showed my father and the family a movie and changed my father's mind. And she started talking about how she was a tribal person. Then she said, I'm born you as a tribal person. Pat said, you're not born me. My husband's tribal. <laughs> what tribe? Well, he's a member of the Ogallala Lakota tribal nation. Their sacred lands are within the, surrounded by the boundaries of the state of South Dakota, but they're the sacred lands of the Lakota. She goes, oh my God, hits her forehead and said, your husband's Billy Mills. Patricia said, how do you know about my husband? That Running Brave is the movie my brother showed my family in Northern India, and we've all studied it. 
now my brother is getting less ready to show us. It became a lesson no number one. My brother is getting ready to sh prepare lesson number two. No longer about Indian men. Billy, you are just a catalyst. It's about Indian women from the United States of America. And we want to know how the federal government, how the tribal governments, how the leadership in the Americas provide opportunities for Indian women. They are, are what happens to the Native American women. The United States is either our demise or our, our future. We look to the Native American women in the United States for hope, for direction. And that has duplicated itself in a number of countries throughout the world my wife and I have traveled to. They look toward our Native American women for hope, for direction, for confidence, to stay the course and pursue their dreams. And that was the meaning of the movie. Great, thank you. We have a few other questions in the queue and we're not gonna be able to get to them, but please let me uh, remind people that we're gonna leave the discussion uh, section open in the event page. And if we can continue the discussion there, we also on our social media uh, channels, hashtag Bright Path Strong, uh, also reach out to Running Strong, uh, Huntsman Game, Senior Games, uh, contact them with any questions and we'll follow up with you. It has been an amazing, amazing time with you today. And I just uh, want to thank again, you know, Billy, um, <laughs> you're just wonderful. You know, you're just fabulous. Bob, you're, you're tremendously fabulous too. And, um, but Billy, thank you for your words on behalf of all these great people. And thank you for remembering them, saying their name, saying their name. And thank you for sharing the many events that shaped your lives today, both of you. Um, it, it was just a blessing for all of us to be with you. Uh, again, um, take care of yourselves out there. Be careful with COVID. It's real, it's dangerous. And I want all of you in my family out there and our family to be with us so we can gather again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Miigwech. My final comment, I want to thank my Running Strong family and our extended family that makes the dreams come true for our Indian youth. And I want to thank Bright Path, Bright, Bright Path Foundation. Our, thank you. you. Thank you, Miigwech. God bless. Bye-bye. And if you haven't bought Bob's book yet, get on, get on our store, get a mug and get Bob's book and sit down and read it. Enjoy your tea and coffee. Also, Billy Mills and. Bye. Thank you.